Right, welcome everyone to Vazlift's episode uh, eight. I'm very excited today because I've got a uh, very high level uh, bodybuilding coach on, uh, my coach, adding pins from Team Stacking Plates. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick introduction for, for adding. So adding pins is one half of Team Stacking Plates alongside her husband, Chester Rockwell. Um, in terms of the history of adding pins, she uh, started off as a runner when she was very young, then got into bodybuilding after a knee issue, uh, and she's been uh, bodybuilding and coaching ever since. Uh, a large sort of feather in her cap last year uh, was her coaching two IFBB pros, which is amazing. I think that's uh, awesome. Uh, I think lots of, uh, you know, lots, there are lots of coaches out there, and it's, it's great when a coach does a successful prep, but it's even better when you can actually coach one to be an IFBB pro. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. If you can call me AP, that works too. Probably a bit more comfortable. <laughs> awesome. Definitely, I will do. All right. So AP, we will begin with uh, the first question. So uh, what would your priorities as a coach be for a female who is entirely new to the gym tracking lifestyle, uh, specifically in terms of nutrition, where would you begin? In terms of nutrition, okay, well, that's, that's generally the most overwhelming part of the programming. Um, so I try to make it as simple as possible. And it's going to, where we start varies from where the individual is actually at. So I'll usually have them, um, I won't change anything at first, actually, particularly if they've never tracked before. I recommend that you just get used to the habit of tracking. So don't change your eating habits, but get a good tracking app and just start, you know, logging whatever you eat mm -hmm. and um, just get comfortable with that habit. And you teach them, you know, how to weigh things, how to properly log recipes. And then once they're a bit more comfortable with that, then we can get a good idea of where their natural eating habits leave them in terms of macros and calories and then see where is the most realistic point to move from there. Um, generally, you know, the best thing anybody can do for themselves is learn how many calories it takes to maintain their weight because that's the baseline for everything. If you know that number, then just a tweak in percentage will help you to start to grow. A tweak in it um, to make it a deficit will begin uh, shedding fat. So we definitely spend a lot of time um, establishing that baseline. And, you know, I like to keep women at maintenance as much as possible. You can actually make quite transformative effects just putting a woman on maintenance calories and then have her on some basic training programs. So that, that's usually where I would start with somebody new. That, that sounds great. I mean, I, I generally start off the same way. So for a complete newbie, I'll just start with the process of tracking. Now, in terms of the difficulties that I've had, um, it's, it's really been a case of getting them into the habits and being able to use the right sort of uh, tracking software. What, what do you recommend to your clients, what tracking software? My favorite is Chronometer, but it's, that's just because of the amount of information that it gives, but it's not actually the easiest tracking app to use. <laughs> but, you know, if somebody's never used one before and you just, you know, they don't have anything to compare it to. I actually find the ones that have the most difficulty with it are ones that are used to like my fitness pal or other apps. And then they switch to that and it's a little bit more meticulous, but um, that is my favorite tracking app. Excellent. And uh, what sort of difficulties have you run into when trying to explain the process of measuring food out? Cause I think that's really quite intimidating. When, when I first started it, not having someone to actually show me visually, uh, or through writings and how can I, how do I actually track this stuff? I was scanning in a lot of labels and things like that. So what, what sort of methods do you use for, to, to get down to this, the nitty gritty of actually tracking your food, weighing things out, et cetera? Well, if somebody's having a specific problem, I may actually just film a little YouTube video for them. Mm. Know, like this is how you can track your oil, put it on the scale, um, press tear, Coin, whatever, put it back on, and that's how many grams that you use. Ta da! <laughs> so I may mean, take it problem by problem. Yeah. Um, the best thing you can do, like I said, it's quite overwhelming. So just make it as simple as possible and just keep, you know, uh, 
repeating that consistency is the key. You know, don't don't be stressing out about oh well this app says this much for three ounces and this app says this much because yes that's that can be really overwhelming. But just just pick one, stick with it. Doesn't matter if it's you know thirty calories higher or lower than the other one. Um, just stay consistent. I, I like that approach, and I, I often say to my clients, you know, where we start is simply a line in the sand, and how you how you uh, uh, sort of react to that is then deciding factor in where we're going to go. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So let's say you've established um, maintenance sort of routine. They've got a good track on being able to uh, sort of track their food, etc. Um, what where do you push them to, towards next? What are the the more the, the later sort of intricacies that you might work with? I guess it depends on their goals where we go next. Um, as I said, you know, a lot of women end up really, really liking how they look and feel once they just realize how many calories that it takes to maintain their body weight. And honestly, a lot of my coaching is just to get women to that number. <laughs> um, that alone can be a little bit of a difficulty because women are often told that they overestimate how much they need, and a certain type of female hearing this ends up chronically under eating and absolutely believing that their maintenance is 1400 calories. And just getting them like, well, you know, you're actually really, really tall. So there's zero way <laughs> this, is, this is your maintenance. So that can just be, you know, that can take months sometimes. And as much as I would love to just throw it on them and be like, no, you know, grow up eat this amount that's not it's not realistic for some people and you have to be compassionate and work with their comfort yeah I, I totally agree i had a client a few years ago and um it was fairly obvious that she was having some binge issues on the weekend and she was she saw blind she was only eating 800 calories every day you know for like a year which it was just it was just but physically impossible um so when i tried to put her on a higher level of calories which reflected more maintenance uh unfortunately it never really worked out um, and she just she just couldn't handle that. It can be really hard, and you know, um, I deeply sympathise because I've been there. You know, I have been told by coaches for ages that, you know, I I couldn't eat this, I couldn't eat that. I was too fat for that. I was definitely overestimating my maintenance, and I well, it was, I was not. <laughs> just put it that way. Um, and eating more, yes, you know, for some people it can it can trigger a type of panic that makes them overeat because they're just like, oh my gosh, if I eat this amount, I'm going to get fat. And they just, it can trigger some very violent reactions. So I don't agree with reverse dieting at all. But in these cases, sometimes you have to just make small increases yeah. just to get them comfortable you know like okay look let's let's not try and up everything at once which macro are you comfortable eating more of what do you what do you like what do you like to eat do you like nut butters great we're gonna up just your fats let's get your fats up so let's just start adding in and bit by bit you know they get comfortable and they realize hey i'm feeling better as i eat more hey i'm looking great as i eat more and they become desensitized and the fear goes away just by, you know, facing it and slowly, incrementally moving them away from the bad habits. Yeah. And uh, I, I can speak to the fact that there is a light at the end of the tunnel because I, I generally always felt that I had a fairly slow metabolism, but after working with you guys, I, I can maintain my body weight now on 32, 3,500 calories pretty easily. Um, so there, once you get it right and once your body is really clicking in the right way, uh, it, it, you can do a lot with it. You'd be surprised. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. We weren't treated gently. We're just like, eat this. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it worked. It worked great. Um, also, I think that's a really good wrap up for that question. So thank you for that. Um, moving on to the next one then. So this is a some feedback that I've had a lot from um, either women I coach, not so much women I coach, I guess, but certainly women I've talked to, women I, I, I've worked with previously, um, that entering a gym for the first time and committing to a training routine can be an intimidating experience. So they sort of prefer the kind of spin class routine, sort of the, you know, the general, we're working together as a class, everybody do this. I'm not really a fan of that. Um, and what would be your advice here to get someone to do something which is a bit more individualized and really stress the importance of hard weightlifting as opposed to just doing, you know, spin classes? Well, I think um, at least initially, if somebody's really, really frightened to go to the gym, 
And that spin class is the difference between exercising and not exercising to the spin class, at least initially, you know. Um, but there are limits to that because um, it's, you know, it's only training your lower body and you've got a completely, you know, but you've got a top half too, mm -hmm. which can't be, <laughs> can't be ignored. And particularly for women, you know, the issue of bone density is a big one. And spin class, you do have a certain amount of impact, but it's generally not as effective as resistance training for protecting your bone density or even improving if possible. But um, weightlifting is something that women should consider or resistance training of some kind for that reason, for bone density. You know, depending on your childhood and your diet during your teens, you may never have even reached peak bone density. And wherever you're at, we start going down from our mid twenties. Mm. And resistance training can help you protect what you have, uh, as long as it's paired with proper diet, of course, but um, it can help you protect what you have. Or in some cases, I have seen some cases of improvements, but long story short, if you want to be somebody who breaks their hip by you know, closing a door too hard and the wind blows on you, um, you will neglect weight training. It is something that you will want to sort of ease yourself towards some form in time. And, um, you know, even if it means, okay, you're more comfortable with a group setting, looking at the other classes at your gym that includes weightlifting, you know, take that same group of friends that you're comfortable with and move over into one of these group classes to sort of get you started. Um, those classes, you know, some depending on the instructor, they can be really good if they're smaller classes and you have one or two instructors that are going to be watching you for form, it could be a really good way to sort of slowly you know, climatize to weightlifting. Um, another option is, you know, hire a, a house trainer. And uh, if you're not comfortable, you know, if, you, if you're afraid of taking on a program on your own, uh, that could be an easy way to get in, you know, hire a trainer that you feel comfortable with and have them show you around the weight room. The, the equipment can be really overwhelming. You know, even, even I who've been in the gym for years when there's, you saw me with on the pendulum machine, I got stuck. Uh, you know, can, <laughs> yeah. We talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it can be overwhelming. And I absolutely get it. Yeah. But it happens should, to me too. Yeah. You know, and so I can absolutely understand. And of course, if you've never been in the weight room and you've got all of these, you know, contraptions it can be overwhelming and it can be enough to deter someone. So in those cases, hire a trainer or, or go in with a friend who you know has been lifting for a while and will be you know, welcome to show you. That's mm -hmm. a really good point regarding the bone density. It's not something I've ever really considered. Is, is that more um, exclusive to women? Uh, I, I, I really don't know too much about it. I think women are more at risk for osteoporosis than men, but mm. I believe we all use bone density as we age. Mm. Brilliant. But it's a much bigger problem for women. And um, like I said, also, too, you know, we have a lot of problem with this dieting culture now where girls are dieting younger and younger, mm. and um, they can be affecting their bone development. Oh, maturity. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So aside from bone density, um, and, and what, what are the benefits can we get from an actual uh, hard sort of resistance training routine, which, which, would, which would appeal to women? Body composition changes, of course. You know, many times um, the bodies that the women are wanting to look like have more lean mass than them, and it can have absolutely transformative effects on a physique just adding, you know, three to five pounds of lean mass, which will take time. Mm -hmm. But... Um, it makes it easier to diet when you have more lean mass too, so you can get a little bit leaner. You can generally get a better overall look to your body with more lean mass. I 100% agree. And the feedback that I've got from women who arrive at me, having had the experience of crash dieting on lots of cardio before, is that they've, tend to, they've lost a lot of weight, scale weight previously, and it's come on it's come back on just as fast. And I tend to think in those circumstances, it probably wasn't fat loss. It was a lot of glycogen and water um, and because of the crash diet and the lack of resistance training. Whereas if you have a situation where you've got a lady who's resistance training, she's looking to sensibly increase her weight through the gym. She's able to do that because she's eating a good diet. While the weight loss will be slower, it will more likely be fat, true fat loss and actually stay off. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Also too, if you're... Um 
I find the, the rebound rate is harder on women with, this is anecdotal, but on women with lower um, mean body mass, because to get them sort of lean, that sort of lean type look, you generally end up pushing a woman with low lean mass into underweight territory to sort of get that look. And the body gets really, really unhappy with that. And the knee-jerk reaction, it's just a really, really strong slingshot out of there because it's not happy with that. Whereas when you have a little more lean mass, you can get that look within a healthy weight uh, or a healthier weight where the body isn't so uh, defensive. I, I think that's a great point. It's a great summary of, of the benefits of resistance training. And for any women who are out there just, you know, who, and this speaks to you, um, you know, you've got a, a very high level coach telling you that this is a good idea for everybody, regardless of your rate of experience. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think, before I forget, women generally don't have really good upper body strength. Naturally, we have a lower amount of mean mass and our upper body's lower amount of strength. And resistance training and if it's just body weight training, can improve your overall functionality. You know, it's quite an empowering thing to be a woman who can't move a five gallon bottle of water and then able to lift that up and put it on the water dispenser in your office. And these are things that weightlifting can, can move you towards. Um, just better quality of life, being able to do more for yourself because it's actually a striking amount of women who I'll be at the grocery store and we buy, a, we buy in bulk and I'll be watching this lady deadlifting um, <laughs> a, a two gallon pack of milk, you know, <laughs> really struggling to get this off the shelf. You know, so these are things that weightlifting can actually help you with. I'm not, I'm not trying to laugh at these people. I'm just saying how... Lifting. No, of course, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I, I think that's a great point about empowering women as well. I think that's a, that's a super good point. So, uh, yeah, D definitely something that, that I think that will speak to a lot of the audience. That's really, that's really good. Um, so moving on to the next question. So now looking at more, uh, let's say a, la a lady who's been in the gym for a while and she's looking to enter her, her first time competition, uh, you know, a physique competition. So thinking of contest prep, um, First time coaching a female to contest shape, um, what, what, what are we looking for? What am I in for there? I as in you, the coach? Yeah, let's say, let's say I'm the coach and I have a first time female client who's looking to compete this year. Um, what am I in for? Okay. Um, one thing is that female athletes tend to need a more refeeds more regularly than men, definitely. Um, you know, we are pushing, female bodies are kind of resistant, are very resistant to dieting. And in the case of a physique athlete, you are taking a woman who's at a healthy body fat level and pushing her into territories that are, you know, borderline quite unhealthy, if not just flat out unhealthy. So the kind of pushback that you're going to be getting from the body is much, is very strong. So it's very important to make sure that refeeds are a part of their programming. Um, also, that will help in terms of them being able to adhere as well, particularly at certain parts of, you know, the menstrual cycle where appetite just goes through the roof. You know, you're going to have an increase in appetite anyways from dieting. You know, I think you have changes in leptin levels within the first week and have like a 30 to 50 percent drop. Um, and that alone can start making all of these changes that get you hungrier, that get you, um, you know, metabolic rate drops. But then you add in the wonderful <laughs> effects of PMS where you just, you're hungry, your stress tolerance is lower. Um, it's just really, really important to make sure that your female athlete has a light at the end of the tunnel regularly. So I don't recommend um, having a refeed or not having a refeed for longer than two weeks, two days in a row at a surplus. That's really interesting. So if we were to sort of structure that, would that be a case of say, yeah, let, let's say, you know, we wouldn't go longer than two weeks, but let's say for example, a regular, a regular weekly two day refeed, and then perhaps an additional larger one around the menstrual period. Would that be reasonable? You can absolutely do that. I mean, how, how gently or how hard you push will depend on a few things. It's going to depend on how far away the show is and the conditioning of the athlete. Um, also, you know, some women are a little bit more sensitive. Like they, they get 
kick back really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Many times those are women who diet frequently. You know, they really didn't take that long of an off season. And then the minute they return to the deficit, the body's like, oh, this again. <laughs> so yeah, yeah totally. Like right off the bat. So you have to take the individual into account. But yeah, I mean, it's absolutely a perfectly acceptable strategy to move somebody to maintenance when their cravings are the worst or just structure a refeed around, like I said, around that time, put one there so that they can um, have it either when they're the hungriest or at least have it the week where they're the hungriest so they can, it helps with adherence that way. I'm going to ask you a follow-up question because I think this will be on the minds of a lot of people who are listening. How if we are taking fairly frequent refeeds, how aggressive can we be during those diet days? Um, what, what, what are you thinking? Since the, the weight loss will naturally be a little bit slower, even by percentage, how aggressive can we be? I don't like to be too aggressive because the, um, in my, we're talking about the natural female athlete. You don't yeah. want to be too aggressive. You don't want to have too large drops right off the bat. Um, just I find that that tends to trigger these knee-jerk reactions a lot faster. I prefer to stay um, within like the 15% drops, mm -hmm. you know, that's a safe range. Uh, anything smaller than that, not, you know, too much, but um, you don't want to be too aggressive. How aggressive you can go will depend on the person. Like I said, some people are very sensitive and there's a very, very strong psychological factor as well. Mm -hmm. um, when you're dieting, sometimes just your attitude and, and relationship with your eating can change. Um, and it can be greater or less in different people. Um, so you may just find women that have incredible anxiety just at the thought of dropping their calories. So in those women, you definitely don't want to be packing off hundreds of calories at a time because that anxiety alone can push them into very bad um, behavior. It can affect their behavior with their eating and even trigger binges. Or I, I've read also that that sort of level of anxiety can actually translate into physical symptoms of feeling lightheaded and, and, and hyper. Uh, hypoglycemic so it, whereas you may have a situation where somebody's like look i need to eat every x number of hours i must have this food i must have this or i'm going to go lightheaded a lot of that can be psychosomatic it, it can be yes mm. i definitely can't can't rule that out um mm. i've never had that myself i generally don't enforce um a certain amount of meals. I explain, like, listen, you don't have to be eating eight meals a day, but if eating eight little meals a day is what's going to get you to it, here, have at it. You know, but that's fine. Just don't go over your calories or don't want to eat. On uh, on that note, it's, it's just a slightly off the topic, but um, in regards to fasting, uh, so intermittent fasting, different fasting protocols, either 16, 8, 24 hour fast, etc. With the differences with men and women, what have you found in that regard and how well women can cope with fasting um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a fat loss phase? Women, in my experience, don't do that well on intermittent fasting, at least to a certain point. Hmm. Um, pushing, pushing your first meal a little bit later in the day can sometimes help to control how many calories that you have in the day. Hmm. But... Uh, I found that that can, they can get away with it for so long and then all of a sudden bad things start to happen again. Like I, I found that it can increase the likelihood of a binge. Some women find that when they force their eating window smaller, when they're really, really hungry, but they're just waiting, waiting, waiting to eat, when they finally do, it can be, it can actually make them overeat. Mm -hmm. So... I will say to somebody who's interested in it, you can kind of do it ad hoc. If you're having a day where you really just aren't that hungry and you feel like you can push your first meal forward comfortably to condense your eating window, go ahead, give it a try. Uh, if you try it and bad things happen, that's the end of it. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much how I would approach that. I don't enforce it. I don't say it's a bad idea, um, but it will depend on the person. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so just changing gears a little bit. Um, can and uh, I guess should women train with more relative volume than, than men? Can. 
Um, yes, I mean, should is a different question. I mean, I generally don't like to set rules on this because depending on who's listening, <laughs> you tell one person more volume's good, they'll add a drop set. You tell the next person to add more volume and their entire life turns into a circuit. So um, when it comes to picking volume for clients, I always start right at the bottom, right at the bottom amount of effective volume because it can be very individual how much a person needs. So go right down to the bottom of 40 to 70 reps per muscle group twice a week um, and stay on the low end of that and see what happens. And um, I find that, I, I personally find that my female clients tend to do better on the lower to moderate end of things, personally. Mm. But I know that female um Women can do better when certain load percentages, like they can push it for higher reps than men. Mm -hmm. But again, when it comes to how much they need for say hypertrophy, I don't want to put a general rule that you need to be putting women on higher volume right off the bat. Always start from the bottom. Yeah. Um, I think as with everything, we sort of individualize and personalize. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it's certainly interesting to speak in generalities, but in regards to actual coaching individuals, I think we, we generally take the same sort of approach and, and treat individual case uh, as, as its own. Awesome. Um, all right. So moving on to uh, a sort of a slightly different topic regarding the, the menstrual cycle, we've kind of touched on it a little bit in terms of nutrition. But um, something that I've been interested in over the years is how should a coach adjust nutrition and training uh, for their female clients according to their menstrual cycle? Is, is this something we should even really take note of with regards to training? Certainly we might do in regards to nutrition. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Let me answer this carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are definite changes in the female body in terms of how they respond to training and certain um, macros at different points of their cycle. Mm -hmm. But there's also something to be said about reducing the stress levels of the client. And what I will usually recommend in these cases is, can you make these changes? Absolutely. Should you make these changes? It depends on where you are at and, and what your disposition is. Because that level of micromanagement can absolutely optimize your programming. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what is optimal can distract from what is essential. And that's something you have to be careful with. It's going to depend on the person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if that level of micromanagement is going to be overwhelming to you or feed into a level, an issue that you have with control, because, you know, there are, there's a certain type of female dieter that will... Um, not be able to sleep until they rush and change their uh, log because a grape rolled out of their fruit salad so they didn't eat it. So, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a certain type of dieter out there that will benefit from these type of adjustments and others that will not. And what I would recommend is start with the absolute basic programming. Focus on the essentials, you know, Get how, learn how many calories that it takes to maintain your weight and then learn how many calories it takes to sensibly um, achieve your goals and see if you are somebody that can respond and get to your goals with this basic programming because if you can and you're comfortable and you're not struggling with certain things um, at points of your cycle when it comes to training, uh, let me go back, let me just focus on nutrition first. Mm -hmm. If you can get away with the simplest form of programming, do it. You know, because I have been prepping my athletes on just linear calorie, in linear macros throughout the week, and then obviously the refeeds, but not toggling, not making these changes in terms of the menstrual cycle, and they're getting, you know, great results. So is it, can it be done and can it be beneficial? Yes, absolutely. Does it need to be done? see the per you know check with the person first see how the person responds to more basic programming yeah yeah that's that's awesome um love it fantastic answer and i, I think that's generally how i start as well um as as i said previously i think we all 
we all tend to, it's fun to talk in generalities, but in, we'll generally start off with a sort of individual approach. And the reality is just getting them down to a basic, uh, easy, basic routine. The easiest routine that they can progress on, I think, is, is a good standard to start with. Um, awesome. So I'm actually out of questions, but I feel like I've got such a good resource here on, on training and diet and women in general. Um, I'd like to just ask you if there's anything else um, you would stress as uh, a coach uh, in general. Well, I didn't actually finish answering my question. Okay. Training section. <laughs> um, should you adjust your training according to your menstrual cycle? This, I would definitely lean more towards yes, absolutely. Um, but this is more in response to monitoring your energy levels just as a human being. In the later section of our cycle, say week four, sometimes even for some women into week three, we get more lethargic, um, coordination goes down, energy level is down, strength is down. And during these types of your times of your cycle, it can be you're at a greater risk of injury if you're trying to say do something like high intensity intervals. You know, if you're you are if your coordination is down, that's probably not the best time to be pushing that sort of thing. Um, so I would recommend that if you are somebody who finds yourself very you know, definitely your quality of life is impacted by your menstrual cycle. During those weeks, feel free to pull back on your training. With my clients, I recommend that they either reduce the weight or reduce the sets or rep count or a combination of all of the above. I've even had some cases where some women um, just were feeling so bad and they take a few days off. You know, it's, um, you want to work with your energy levels and you should never be you shouldn't be pushing your body when deep down, you know, this is probably not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So particularly when, if any of my girls have um, intervals on their preps, they, anytime that they get sent that in their programming, there's this huge disclaimer on the top where it says, if at any point you're going into these and you feel as though you are not able to maintain control of your form in your intervals, if your energy levels are low and you just don't feel that you really have it in you to push to this intensity, do not attempt this workout. Please just do this or skip, you know, skip it completely. And I find that when you teach somebody to sort of respect their energy levels, and this can be for men too, by the way, if you're just feeling lethargic, if you haven't been sleeping, if you ate less yesterday, and if you're just listening to your energy levels and just adjust your training according, um, you can get better results that way. And um, yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree regarding uh, the training. Um, I don't work with as many female clients as I would like to, but I'd certainly like more experience in that. But with regards to men, I have a fair bit of um, inbuilt individualization with the routine. So sort of a, a feedback that I can provide my clients depending on how well they're feeling during the course of the week is how strongly they'll sort of progress or they'll just stay the same that week uh, in terms of how much volume they're doing or in terms of how much weight they're lifting. So there is that sort of inbuilt um, uh, gu a gauge for, for my training. I think that's really useful. Yeah. That's perfect. Awesome. Okay, brilliant. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do really feel sorry about interrupting you earlier. <laughs> so um, I do feel like I should should get you back on once I think of some more questions. But is there anything else that you feel you, you'd like to stress as, as a coach? As a coach? Um, hmm. Just in general for sort of female training, diet, etc. One thing that I'll actually give an advice to other coaches, particularly when you're dealing with women, there is this, and it's not wrong, but there is this general um, assumption that when a woman comes to you saying, hey, I'm eating 1,200 calories and I'm not losing weight, the answer is, ha ha, you're not, you're not, you're eating more than you think you are. Mm -hmm. And um, thanks, love. Chess is in the room, by the way, and I just got past some notes, so I feel really, really <laughs> important right now. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I'll do that, yes. Um, I don't remember what I was just saying. Um, it was regarding um, a, a woman eating, say, 1,200 calories and being told ah, by her yes. coach, it, it, you know, she's not eating that much. There is a chance that she is not tracking correctly, but there's also a chance that she might be an individual who has been chronically dieting for ages and has been eating that much, really, for a very long time. And 
telling a person like that you're not tracking properly or you need to, you know, you need to eat less. That's very dangerous. Mm. So in those people, yes, it's good to assess eating habits, but I've actually more often than not in those situations, these women are tracking correctly, but they have been chronically dieting. And the minute that you pull you increase their intake to maintenance, they just, um, their bodies start changing, they start feeling better. So some women are in fact chronically under eating and you can't, you can't just generalize that sort of, you know, report from a client or a, a, a new client. You can't just assume that. That's something you need to be careful with. And I see it happening a lot and I've seen some bad effects come from it because then these women start pushing their intake lower and lower and lower. And this is so bad, you know, Dieting is rough <laughs> on the body. And, you know, when a woman has been chronically dieting for a long time, it has really bad changes. Bone density is one, like we've talked about. You know, the body will leach calcium from bones. So you, um, yeah, that's something that you need to watch out for as a coach. I think that's a, it's a great point. And it relates back to one of the first things you were saying about just taking a female client right back up to maintenance and have her performing some good resistance training and just seeing, seeing what happens there, uh, which is, you know, which is a great strategy, I think. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely, um, I personally, maybe it's just the type of client that I attract, mm -hmm. but I personally find that women tend to need encouragement, knowing that it's okay to eat, that you're allowed to eat. Like there's this, there's this shame that I notice that comes along with it. You really have to convince some clients like you deserve to eat. Your body deserves food. You know, just because you want to change the way that you look, just because you are um, unhappy with perhaps your body composition, doesn't mean that you need to punish yourself with starvation. The route to the road to looking the way that you want to may, in fact, be by eating more. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's uh, that's. That's a lesson that I wish more women knew. I think that's, yeah, I think that's a great point. It's one of my frustrations with, with what I see with some coaches out there is this sort of rigid, um, rigid script that they'll have to, you know, with, with their clients in terms of, okay, you're not losing weight. Well, obviously, you know, you're not tracking enough. You've got to eat less, blah, 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 uh, or various rigid recommendations, which I think are ultimately quite harmful um, to, to their clients, whether they're male or, or female. Um, so yeah, as in either things like that or just sort of voodoo things like, you know, you got to stop eating bread or you got to do fasted cardio and, and sort of these kind of very, very general recommendations without any nuances. Um, I, I find a lot of that it's, it's sort of opens a window into what type of coach that they are potentially. Um, and it, it's not, it, it can be quite damaging. It can be damaging. And many times those are coaches that don't want to put too much effort into the situation. So yeah. what they'll do is they'll give these really, really restrictive guidelines that will guarantee results because they're not eating anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, exactly. Exactly. And then, the, but then the, the, the thing is always, well, what happens afterwards? What about the aftercare? Uh, are they going to blow back up afterwards, you know, because they've just been restricted for too long and then all of a sudden they kind of snap and, and away they go. So I think your approach certainly that you took with me was, was a much more nurturing approach and kind of figuring out what I wanted to do and then just pushing me in the right direction. And that, and that really worked well. well. I'm glad you enjoyed your experience. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly did. <laughs> it wasn't easy, but we got there in the end. That's true. <laughs> we did so, and we pushed you hard, by the way. Like, don't, mm -hmm. you know, when he says nurturing, he's, uh, <laughs> that's what I, call it. I, I very gently coaxed him to stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was, uh, we had to, there was some long, some long cardio sessions and, and some, some dry meals involved, but we, we got there. That's good. <laughs> that was a situation where, you know, our prep time, you know, that was a situation where we generally wouldn't want to do that if we had more time, but we had a certain amount of time to get something done. And in those yeah. cases, sometimes you have to. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I would have done exactly the same thing with another client. It was just a case of it was a mountain of a job, <laughs> and we we had a limited amount of time. So yeah, there was there's absolutely zero zero wrong with what we did. I thought it was, I thought it worked very very well considering the circumstances, um, and I had no rebound afterwards, which is which is awesome. So uh, yeah, proof in the pudding. Work, though. You know, I yeah. mean, you you put the work in. That was great. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you 
very much. It really was a pleasure for you to be on and uh, to have you on. And uh, I love the fact that we could put something out there for uh, beginner women, you know, the casual gen pop kind of women, female clients, uh, and also for competitors as well. Because I think it's a, it is a very nuanced, um, it's particularly when we talk about the details of, of coaching females, it is a very nuanced uh, thing. And uh, it's nice to have someone who's such an expert uh, on, on women's uh, coaching to be able to talk freely on this. So uh, big thank you. And, and uh, I hope a lot of people tune into this one. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I absolutely appreciate the um, <laughs> <laughs> the Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. And uh, right, uh, we'll speak soon. Take care. Okay. Have a good one.